Good morning, good day, good evening, whenever you're listening to this. Welcome once again to Just Thoughts. Just another day of rebellion. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Another day in this generation of the fig tree. This vile generation which is turning its back on God evermore. Another day where another township in the United States of America has voted to do away with the Pledge of Allegiance from their meetings. Another day where another sports icon decides to take a knee instead of standing for our national anthem. Another monument to remember the past is torn down because it's not politically correct. Another show on the Science Channel mentions global climate change as if it's some kind of a factual reality when it's still just a theory. Another historical documentary makes sure to rehash slavery even though the show had nothing whatsoever to do with that subject. And the programming continues. And the bellows of hatred keep feeding a long dead fire. Another day where a child is raped in a gender-neutral bathroom and none consider what an ignorant decision that was. Another protest by a bunch of brainwashed, butthurt, college whiners wearing hoodies and handkerchief masks, chanting and throwing stones because they are so ignorant that they believe their actions are simply civil discourse. Perhaps they have not been taught the definition of the word civil. One thing is for sure, they certainly have not been taught American history. Another day where another popular cable, satellite, or internet streaming movie channel or series introduces a gay and lesbian character or couple or situation while trying to normalize the building blocks of perversity which were laid before them. And yet, they continue to grow in popularity, they continue to gain subscribers and people who will pay to see their filth. Another day where another decision by our government to do away with normal choice of two genders on its census and all of its applications and paperwork has become the law of the land. Speaking of law, another law is amended and adopted which causes greater division and furthers the cause of the wicked in separating people from God as they bicker over the rights of the ungodly or the fleshly versus the laws of God as many decide to walk the path of Cain, the path that leads to destruction. Now we know the Hollywood left and the entertainment world left love to roll in the proverbial fecal matter of pandering to these so-called alternative lifestyles. But what is worse is to constantly have to watch our elected officials first sniff, then kiss the unwiped asses of the leftists. And still worse, the so-called right, that is to say the right wing, stand by and smile with very little to say in protest as if they agree with these gross forms of brainwashing and of course the normal miscarriages of justice and fairness which have become so prevalent in our world in this time. 
What a pandering nation we have become. What a bunch of spineless wimps, worried about their reputations, afraid of being labeled. And another generation of freeloaders raised themselves up, acting as if they are owed something, simply because they have been born. Another group of the radical left act as if they are outraged when four of them, uh, four um, <laughs> females who hate this nation and specifically who hate Christianity, normalcy, and the Constitution, which made our nation the best ever, gain themselves in popularity and are even running for office or for higher offices. This land gave them freedom of speech. This nation gave them the freedoms they enjoy. Yet they use their freedom of speech to seize venomous words of hate against our nation and against anyone who disagrees with their blind, narrow view. One would think it should be obvious to anyone with half a brain to see their open loathing for America as they preach socialism and push for everything and anything that is against God or that God has said are abominations and filth. And yet, they still have crowds of grinning idiots chanting voting, useful idiots, to empower them further. Their game is simple. They create hate and division, and then they capitalize on that hate by claiming that they are the ones who loathe and despise hate. They practice unfairness, then yell inequality at those who they unfairly accuse or use. And though there are many that can see it and see right through them, that many seem to have no will to speak against it for fear of being called or labeled as racist or bigoted. You know, thank God for those who do speak up and stand proudly like Daniel or Elisha alone, being vastly outnumbered by people who do not even attempt to hide their agenda anymore. People are so lost today, beckoned by the call of what they think this temporal flesh can do for them. Always wanting something for nothing, always demanding more and more, always cutting down the rights of the Christian, the law-abiding, and the taxpayer, and taking away from those who have served our nation, or the elderly. You know, the other day I was looking at one of my videos, and one lady wrote me and said that she had been a faithful Christian for a very long time, until God did not answer her prayers. And now she believes in nothing, and not only does she not believe in anything, but she's quite vocal about it, quite bitter. You know, if I had a dime for every prayer that I have asked that was not answered, I'd be a very rich man. Yet my faith is intact. Because I know that I cannot see what God can see. And that my prayer, whether for good things, for others, such as a healing, or for myself that I might be better able to succeed in this world and make my way, often go unanswered. Or maybe I should say, have been unanswered thus far. Yet even so, I hold to my faith and to my Lord and Savior knowing that nothing in this life is so important that I should lose my salvation over it. I wrote this lady back and told her that it was apparent 
that uh, she had probably little faith to start with because she had the internet or she could not have written me and it's apparent that she had time to be on the internet I dared to say that she probably never misses a meal and no doubt lives in a home whether it is her own or rented she no doubt has air conditioning against the heat of the summer and warmth against the cold of the winter she no doubt has a car and a phone and a job and people who like and even love her yet she is angry with God because her prayers go unanswered well I wonder what she's praying for and even if so it'd be righteous the things she is asking of God and they are unanswered who is she to question God's will in answering her prayers or not Is she thankful to be alive, I wonder? Is she happy to have the things that she does have? I dare say she probably has not known real suffering, like people in third world countries who die of starvation for want of a bowl of soup or a piece of water or even a drink of clean water. Maybe her test was to see whether she would lose her faith if God did test her by not answering her prayers. How you doing, friend? You know, this life is not the life. This life is all about tests, tribulation, and suffering. And it has always been so. You know, if you could speak to the prophets of the Old Testament, they would tell you. If you could speak to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, He would tell you. If you could speak to the apostles, they would tell you. And if you could speak to many Christians down through the ages, they would tell you. And yet people today, though they're not suffering and not really poor, act as though life has treated them so badly and they deserve a handout. Or they think that because they don't get some prayers answered, it's a reason to hate God. You know, do, do you have the blues about life, brothers and sisters? If so, join the club. Okay? Join your many brothers and sisters in Christ who suffer every day in this flesh, whether physically or mentally, because of the world around us. You know, I have seen United States servicemen and women who have returned from war, who have had their bodies ripped apart by roadside bombs or by rocket-propelled ro uh, rockets or... Uh, R RPGs, whatever, who have been maimed by a sniper's bullet, or worse, and yet they still give glory to our Heavenly Father and are not ashamed of the accomplishments that they have made in serving our nation. And some would complain about how bad they have it in our nation because their welfare check is late. Or because, God forbid, their prayers did not get answered in the way they wanted them to be. Or because they claimed that they are an oppressed minority. You know, one of the things that this lady probably ought to realize is maybe no answer to her prayers was the answer. But enough said on that. Incidentally, uh... Before we get into Bible study here, I would like to take the time to mention that YouTube has taken it upon themselves to begin removing some of my videos, claiming that, uh, in their brilliant opinions, that I have violated child safety laws, or some kind of child safety uh, protocol. I guess they didn't really bother to listen to the lectures, or maybe they just did not like the message that they heard. After all, they are of the left side of the aisle persuasion. But be that as it may, our fathers will be done. The sooner all this mess comes to a uh, head, the sooner we'll get out of here. You know, we're just waiting to see the coming of the Antichrist or the buildup of the one world government to a completion, the coming of the Antichrist and then the return of the true Christ. But 
We're going to stay on this subject of rebellion. I just wanted to mention these things in passing. Be turning, if you will, to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Or excuse me, excuse me, not 21. Deuteronomy chapter 1. And that's where we're going to begin today, with Moses addressing the children of Israel as to the commandment of God. And before we begin this Bible study, as you should do, before you study our Father's Word, let us go before our Father's throne, and let us ask our Father, the source of everything and all things, the Creator of all things, for wisdom and guidance in how to understand His message. So, let us pray, and let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, glory be unto thy most holy name, Father. We give thanks unto you, Father, for all that we have. We thank you for this channel, Father, for this ministry, for those who listen, for those who study, whether they're with this channel or another, for those who diligently seek your word, and do their best to please you, Father, and show you reverence and love you. And we ask, Father, that you open eyes and ears and hearts and mind to be able to receive these truths from your very word. We ask, Father, that you shine the light for us to walk in, that we walk not in darkness. We ask that you keep us from the hour of temptation, Father, and lead us and guide us always, so that we may be pleasing to your will. And we ask these things, Father, through the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yehoshua HaMashiach. Amen. And Amen. So, we're going to begin here with Deuteronomy chapter 1. Again, the subject being rebellion. And Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 1, the word of Moses. And that's what it says here. Verse 1. These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on this side of Jordan in the wilderness, in the plain over against the Red Sea between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hazaroth and Dizahab. Now, what you should take away from that is these be the words which Moses spoke to all Israel, all the faithful. That's what Israel is today. So these words are just as pertinent to you as they were to them. Verse 2. There are eleven days journey from Horeb by way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh Barnea, of course, the holy desert of wandering. And Mount Seir, of course, held by the children of Esau. Verse 3. And it came to pass in the fortieth year in the eleventh month, in the first day of the month, that Moses spake unto the children of Israel according to all the Lord had given him in commandment unto them. In other words, Moses is laying it on the line here. Verse 4. After he had slain Sihon, the king of the Amorites, which dwelt in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, which dwelt in Ashtaroth and Idri, Verse 5, on this side of Jordan in the land of Moab, began Moses to declare this law, saying, verse 6, The Lord our God spake unto us in Horeb, saying, Ye have dwelt long enough in this mountain. In other words, Moses is talking about what happened historically here. Verse 7, Turn you and take your journey. And go to the mountain, or the mount of the Amorites, unto all the places nigh thereunto, in the plain, in the hills, and in the vale, in the south by the seaside, to the land of the Canaanites, and unto Lebanon, and unto the great river, the river Euphrates. River Euphrates, incidentally, the border between Babylon and Israel. Verse 8. Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give to them, unto them and to their seed after them. Verse 9. And I spake to you at that time, saying, I am not able to bear you 
myself alone. In other words, Moses was unable to bear the children of Israel by himself alone. Verse 10. The Lord your God hath multiplied you, and behold, this day ye are as the stars of heaven for multitude. Verse 11. The Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times so many more as ye are, and bless you as he has promised you. Verse 12. How can I myself bear your cumbrance, which is to say your trouble, and your burden, and your strife? In other words, these people were constantly murmuring against Moses, constantly murmuring against God, and it was quite a burden to lead all of these people for Moses. Verse 13. Take you wise men, and understanding, and known among your tribes, and I will make them rulers over you. You know, this is what's happening, this is a problem in America right now, is there are not too many wise men and understanding, especially not understanding of our Father's Word, that are being elected to office. Verse 14. And ye answered me and said, The things which thou hast spoken to us is good for us to do. In other words, Israel agreed with Moses. This is a wonderful thing you've told us to do, to have judges over us. Verse 15. So I took the chief of your tribes, wise men, and known, that is to say, known, uh, 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 well known amongst the people, of, of good name, and made them heads over you, captains over thousands, and captains over hundreds, and captains over fifties, and captains over tens, and officers amongst your tribes. In other words, in, in every great nation, there is a hierarchy. Verse 16. And I charged your judges at that time, saying, Hear the causes between your brethren, and judge righteously between every man and his brother, and the stranger that is with them. That would be the Gentile. In other words, don't, don't even uh, unfairly treat the Gentile when they bring a cause before you. Verse 17. Ye shall not respect persons in judgment. In other words, don't be biased. Again, some of our politicians need to learn this lesson. But ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man. In other words, you won't be intimidated by anyone. For the judgment is God's, and the cause is that uh, and the cause that is too hard for you, bring unto me, and I will hear it. In other words, if you've got a problem solving a judgment, bring it to me, and I will listen, and I will consult the Father and get you an answer. Verse 18. And I commanded you at that time all the things that ye should do. Verse 19. And when you departed from Horeb, we went through all that great and terrible wilderness which ye saw by the way of the mountain of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us. And we came to Kadesh Barnea, again, the holy desert of wandering. Verse 20. And I said unto you, Ye are come into the mountains of the Amorites, which the Lord our God doth give unto us. Okay, do you understand that? You have come into the mountain of a, of a people that is mightier than you, but the Lord God has given it unto you. Verse 21. Behold, the Lord thy God has set the land before thee. Go up and possess it. As the Lord God of thy fathers has said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. Verse 22. And ye came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search us out the land, and bring us word again by what way we must go up and into what cities we shall come. Verse 23. And the saying pleased me well, and I took twelve men of you, one of a tribe, in other words, one of each tribe. Verse 24. And they turned and went up into the mountain, and came into the valley of Eshcol, and searched it out. Verse 25. 
And they took of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down unto us. And brought us word again and said, It is a good land which the Lord our God doth give us. Verse 26. Notwithstanding, ye would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. Now, what do we see in this? This is a type of what is happening right now in the world and what has happened consistently over time, history, concerning Christianity, concerning the promises of God. The people murmured and complained and rebelled as they do today. They would rather murmur, complain, and rebel than to accept salvation because they are blinded by the doctrines and lies of fools and the cunning and of course by their own fleshly desires the wiles of the flesh verse 27 and ye murmured in your tents and said because the Lord hated us he has brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to, de Amorites to destroy us you know God had freed these people and they had witnessed it from the bondage of Egypt. And they had destroyed Pharaoh's army and Egypt along with it. And yet now they think God is going to destroy them. Because they were superstitious, blinded idiots. And you have to remember, these were Israel. Verse 28. Whither shall we go up? In other words, how, how shall we go up there? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying the people is greater and taller than we. There's giants in the land. And the cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. In other words, we saw the sons of the giants there. You know, these people have completely forgotten that they have God walking with them. And that God told them that he would give them the land. They have lost their faith in God and followed after their own counsel. Verse 29. Then I said unto you, Dread not, neither be afraid of them. Verse 30. The Lord your God, which goeth before you, shall fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. In other words, you witnessed it. You saw it. Verse 31. And in the wilderness, where thou hast, where thou hast seen how the Lord thy God bare thee, as a man doth bear his son in all the way that ye went until ye came unto this place. In other words, God fed them in the desert, gave them manna, gave them meat, gave them water, saw to it that they wanted for nothing, was a light to them by night, and a pillar of smoke to them by day, so that they would know he was among them. Verse 32. Yet in this thing ye did not believe the Lord your God. In other words, they were intimidated by the giants. They feared the giants. Verse 33. Who went in the way before you to search out the place to pitch your tents in, in the fire by night, to show you the way that you should go, or by what way you should go, and in a cloud by day. In other words, God would have been before them. Verse 34. And the Lord heard your voice, or the voice of your words, and was wroth, and swear, saying, verse 35, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I have swear to give unto your fathers. Verse uh, 36, Save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it, and I will go with him to the land, that he hath trodden upon, and to his children, because they have wholly followed the Lord. And of course, uh, Joshua the son of Nun, verse 37. Also the Lord was angry for me for your sakes, saying, Thou shalt not go in thither. In other words, because of what Moses had done at the uh, wilderness of Zen, where he had struck the rock twice. Verse 38. But Joshua the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. Encourage him, for she, he shall cause Israel to inherit it. In other words, Joshua was not afraid. Joshua was not a little delicate flower. He was a man of God. And he knew that God was with him. And his name also is Yahshua. 
the name of our Lord and Savior. And he took the people into the promised land. What a type we have in that. Yahshua taking us into the promised land. What is the promised land to us today? Is it still that little piece of desert over there in, in uh, Palestine? Where the, what they call Israel? No. It's the kingdom of your father. It will be that place at the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when the kingdoms of this world become his kingdoms. Verse 39. Moreover, your little ones, which she said should be a prey, and your children in that day had no knowledge between good and evil. They shall go in thither. Unto them I will give it, and they shall possess it. Verse 40. But as for you, turn you and take your journey into the wilderness by way of the Red Sea. In other words, turn your asses around, you're going back out into that wilderness, and you're going to die out there. You're not seeing that good land. Good type for you there of how easy it is to lose salvation when you disobey the will of God. Verse 41. Then he answered and said unto me, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight according to all the Lord our God commanded us. And when ye had girded every man his weapons of war, and ye were ready to go up the hill. Verse 42. And the Lord said unto me, Say unto them, Go not up, neither fight, for I am not among you, lest you be smitten before your enemies. You know, you never wanted to go into battle without God. And God was so angry with them, He wasn't going to stand with them, because they disobeyed Him. Good lesson for you to learn. Verse 43, So I spake unto you, and ye would not hear, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord again. And went up presumptuously up into the hill. Verse 44. And the Amorites which dwelt in that mountain came out against you and chased you as bees do and destroyed you in Seir even unto Hormah. In other words, chased them all the way over there. Cut them down as they ran. Verse 45. And ye turn, returned and wept before the Lord. But the Lord would not hearken unto your voice nor give you ear. You know, that's another good lesson for you to learn. If you're hard-headed and stiff-necked and you rebel against the Lord, don't expect Him to answer your prayers. And even if you claim to be faithful and you don't wait upon the Lord to answer your prayers, you needn't expect Him to, uh, to, to pay you any attention. Because He has other children that will pay Him attention. Verse 46. So ye abode in Kadesh many days according to uh, the days that ye abode there. In other words, according to the fulfillment of the prophecy, the 40 years, until all that generation died off. Let's turn over now, and we're going to go read Psalm 5. Psalm of David. David, a very wise man, filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking the word of the Lord and praying to our Father in his psalms written here. So, Psalm chapter 5 and verse 1. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Verse 2. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee I will pray. Verse 3. My voice... Shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. You know, good advice from David here. Start your day off with a prayer that our Father will lead you and guide you through your day and through whatever comes your way. Verse 4. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. You know, there's going to come a time when Satan is destroyed and all those who have followed after him, all those who followed him at the catabole or the catabole. In other words, the overthrow, when Satan attempted to overthrow God. And of course, the people in this earth age who rebel against God, uh, that is, save they go through the millennium and, and find salvation. Verse 5. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all 
Don't skip over that word, all workers of iniquity. God hates all workers of iniquity. He's got nothing for them. Verse 6. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and the deceitful man. Uh, the word leasing here, as it is used, is Hebrew word 3577, kazab. From 3576, it means a falsehood or literally an untruth. Figuratively, it can be an idol, deceitful, false, leasing, liar, lie, lying. That's what the definition is. The Lord shall destroy them that speak leasing, that speak lies, that speak falsely, that speak deceitfully. Verse 7. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in the fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. In other words, most of us don't even really do this. But uh, whenever I pray, usually I stand and face the holy city. That is to say, I face towards Jerusalem. You know, you may have noticed all the graveyards in the United States of America and in Europe and many other places around the world, they all face the Holy Land. There's a reason for that. It's because of doctrines of men necessarily, but... Uh, in other words, in believing that the dead shall be raised in a different manner than it truly means by metaphor. But if you've ever noticed, most of the graveyards in the world, unless they are uh, some older graveyards where people were just simply buried, most of the, and even most of those, face the east. If they're in the United States of America. Verse 8, Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness, because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. In other words, lead me, Father, through my enemies, because of my enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. In other words, show me the way you would have me walk. Verse 9, For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher, that is to say a grave. Th that's an open grave that people can fall into and die, quite frankly. They flatter with their tongue. Now, I want you to think about the politicians in this world today. You know, flattery is Satan's method. And quite frankly, it is the method of those who uh, are running for office these days. Not all of them, but many, especially along the left side of the aisle, and of course some on the right too. But flattery is a method used by those who worship the flesh more than the Creator. That's why you've got all of these politicians waving their little rainbow flags and attending all of these perverse get-togethers. In other words, what I'm trying to say is our government is filled with flatterers. They love flattery. They pander for votes. They kiss the asses of anyone that will vote for them and give them handout and benefits. And of course, they take them away from those who worked and have served this country. Verse 10. Destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. And I say unto you this day, there's many a politician that's going to be begging for a drink of water in the millennium because of what they've accomplished in this life, rebelling against God and pushing socialism upon this nation and trying to do away with our Constitution because they're a bunch of ass-kissers. And there ain't no other way to put it, there ain't no other euphemism that uh, fits better than that. They are ass-kissing idiots. Verse 11. But let all those who put their trust in thee rejoice. 
Let them ever shout for joy, because thou defendest them. Let them also love thy name. Be joyful in thee. How about you, friend? Are you joyful in the Lord? Or are you one of these little delicate flowers that wilts the first time there's any trouble? Verse 12. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous, and will, uh, with favor will thou compass him as with a shield. In other words, God is our protection. And God would have been the protection of the children of Israel, and they would have entered the promised land that first day had they not rebelled against him, as people today rebel against God. Because this is a blinded, wicked generation. Turn over, if you will, to Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20, we're going to continue this subject. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 1. And it came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, in the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. Verse 2. Then came the word of the Lord unto me, saying, Verse 3. Son of man, speak unto the elders of Israel and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Are ye come to inquire of me? As I live, saith the Lord, I will not be inquired of by you. Now you can guess why these people who have come to inquire of the Lord are not going to be heard by the Lord. Verse 4. Will thou judge them, son of man? Will thou judge them? Cause them to know the abominations of their fathers. In other words, put them in memory of what happened to their fathers. Verse 5. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, In the day when I chose Israel, and lifted up my hand unto the seed of the house of Jacob, and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt, when I lifted up my hand unto them, saying, I am the Lord your God. Verse 6. In that day I lifted up mine hand unto them, to bring them forth out of the land of Egypt, into the land that I espied for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. Verse 7. Then I said unto them, Cast ye away every man the abominations of his eyes, that is to say, the things that you covet or the things that you lust for, and defile not yourselves with I the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. In other words, worship me and not the idols of Egypt. Verse 8. But they rebelled against me and would not hearken unto me. They did not, every man, cast away the abominations of their eyes. In other words, they chased after the lust of their eyes. Neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them and accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. Egypt here, uh, the historical, but also a metaphoric type for you, if you can understand what it means. It is a land of oppression, a land of bondage. Think about the United States of America now, with all of these politicians going against the Word of God, going against the Constitution, which was made from the Word of God, going against the rights of men, which were given to them by God to pander to them. Verse 9. But I wrought for my name's sake, that it should not be polluted before the heathen. In other words, God held back among whom they were. In other words, He didn't destroy Israel that rebelled against Him. In whose sight I made myself known unto them in bringing, forth out of the, in bringing them forth out of the land of Egypt. Verse 10. Wherefore, I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. Verse 11. And I gave them statutes and showed them my judgments. In other words, God's judgments, God's statutes, God's thoughts on the matter, God's will, 
which if a man do, he shall live in them, even live in them. Verse 12. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. In other words, God gave us the feast days, yes, but what is the Sabbath that God has given us? What is the rest that God has given us? It is Jesus Christ, Yahshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior. Verse 13. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statues, and they despised my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. And my Sabbath they greatly polluted. Then I said I would pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. Verse 14. But I wrought for my namesake, that it should not be polluted before the heathen, in whose sight I brought them out. Uh, wrought here uh, would be better translated, I uh, withheld my anger for my namesake. In other words, God uh, changed his mind and did not destroy his children Israel because it would have looked, if he had done so, to the Gentiles as though he pulled them out of Egypt only to destroy them as as they believed. And I don't mean the Gentiles, I mean as Israel said, as we read earlier in the words of Moses. Verse 15. Yet also I lifted my hand up unto them in the wilderness, that I would not bring them in the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. And we read that account earlier, and we've read it in other Bible study lectures. They rebelled against God, and He kept them out of the promised land. Again, a type of Christianity and uh, salvation and what happens if you disobey God or you displease God or you worship something other than God. You think you're going to enter into the promised land of heaven? Well, you may after the millennium if you've learned well enough, but you certainly shall not upon your death. Verse 16. That is to say, you shall be present with the Lord upon your death. But many people are going to the other side of the gulf. You know, relate it to the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Or Lazarus and the rich man. Verse 16. Because they despise my judgments. That's, that's why they didn't go into the promised land. Because they despised my judgments and walked not in my statues, but polluted my Sabbaths. For their heart went after their idols. Now, in the last Bible study, I told you that an idol can be anything, okay? It can be the little rainbow flag. It can be the homosexual lifestyle, the gay or the uh, lesbian lifestyle, the pedophile lifestyle. It can be the pursuit of wealth. It can be other religions. It can be prosperity ministry where you drive your Lamborghini and have your gigantic house and say that the Lord has blessed you. It can be sex. It can be power. It can be anything that you covet more than you love the Lord your God. And it causes the borders of hell to be enlarged. Verse 17. Nevertheless, mine eyes spared them from destroying them. Neither did I make an end to them in the wilderness. You can relate this verse that the wilderness is the earth in a metaphor. And God shall spare people. And they shall go through the millennium age. That is to say, the day of the Lord when Christ and His elect and His apostles and the remnant shall all teach so that some of them may be redeemed over that thousand year period before Satan is loosed for his final time before judgment. And before the judgment, that is to say the great white throne judgment, where all are judged. Because it is the will of God that none should perish but that all should come to repentance and change their ways. Verse 18. 
But I said unto their children in the wilderness, Walk ye not in the statutes of your fathers, neither observe their judgments. Why? Their judgments were vile and wicked. Nor defile yourselves with their idols. You know, every generation has been taught this. And people today, politicians today, and people, go out and support socialism, go out and support homosexuality, go out and support lesbianism, pedophilia, genderless, uh, new, gender neutral bathrooms, all kinds of things which God sees as perverse. Why? Because they pander to the flesh. They pander to the desires of men's hearts and not to the will of God which says that these things are perverse. And do these people pay God any mind? Well, sure they do. I saw some of them waving signs the other day that said God is gay. God loves homosexuality. God wants gay marriage. You see, they are polluting God amongst his own children even now in their own conceit and by their own counsels. They are as perverse as that generation that did not enter the Holy Land. And you think they're going to enter the Holy Land? They don't even know who the Antichrist is. They're going to be meat in his hand. Verse 19. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. That's not subject to to opinion. Verse 19. And hallow my Sabbaths. They shall be a sign between me and you. That ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Again, what is our Sabbath now? It's Christ. He is our rest. Do we still hold to the old Sabbath? Yes, we do. We hold to the Passover. We hold to Pentecost. We hold to the Feast of Harvest. And we even hold to the Feast of Lights. Which some people see as unholy. You know, I've had people writing me talking about they don't like how I speak positively about Christmas. Well, there are bad things about Christmas, but there are also good things about Christmas. What was a good thing about Christmas? That's when Jesus Christ began dwelling with man. Not by birth, but by conception. That is when he was conceived. Verse 21. Notwithstanding, the children rebelled against me. They walked not in my statutes, neither kept my judgments to do them, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. They polluted my Sabbaths. Then I said I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the wilderness. Again, think of the wilderness as this earth age, as a metaphor. Verse 22. Nevertheless, I withdrew mine hand and wrought for my name's sake, that it should not be polluted in the sight of the heathen, in whose sight I brought them forth. In other words, God relented. You know, God does not want any of his children to die. And he created all souls. Now, a soul can choose not to be a child of God just by their very actions. But God did create them all. Therefore, He is their patriarch, their father, whether they choose Him or not. Even Satan, Lucifer, was once a child of God. But he chose the wrong path, as did many of his fallen angels. Verse 23. I lifted my hand up unto them also in the wilderness, that I would scatter them among the heathen and disperse them through the countries, which as we know did happen, the tribes of Israel and their migrations. Verse 24, Because they had not executed my judgments, but had despised my statutes, and had polluted my Sabbaths, and their eyes were after their father's idols. Okay? Again, this is historical. They did worship the gods of their fathers, but I want you to see the metaphor of it. When people worship their little rainbow flag and raise it high and have parades for it, how many Jesus Christ parades have you seen in this country? Huh? How many parades for God have you seen in this country? 
None. That's how many. How many heterosexual parades have you seen in this country? None. Why? Because these people want to be lifted up. As Satan was lifted up in pride. They want to be put on a pedestal higher than anyone else. And their perversion bowed to. But there are some of us that are not going to bow to their damn perversion. Because it's putrid, it's filth, and it's sickening. Verse 25. Wherefore I gave them also statutes that were not good. Uh, what does that mean, that God gave us statutes that were not good? It means God told it means God told them what not to do. You see, you could take that the wrong way if you don't study in the Hebrew. This is why it's ultra important to study in the languages. Wherefore, I gave them statutes that were not good. Meaning again, God told them what not to do. And judgments whereby they should not live. In other words, God forewarned us of the things we should avoid. The things that piss him off. Verse 26. And I polluted them in their own gifts. That is to say, their own bribes, their own uh, gifts to themselves. The things that they coveted. And that they cause to pass through the fire all that openeth the womb, that I might make them desolate, to the end that they might know that I am the Lord. In other words, what are we talking about here? They uh, cause them to pass through the fire all that openeth the womb. They sacrifice their children unto Moloch, or, or in Moloch, to Baal. The practice is called Moloch. It means they burned their children unto false gods made of metal. Or false gods, period. They sacrificed their own children. Why? Because out of their minds came this religion that they should burn their children to appease the gods. Does this sound familiar to you? Think about modern America today where abortion for a child that would open the womb in other words, a child is conceived, and if left alone, he would open the womb. In other words, he'd be, he would be born. But no, now they're aborted. And they're aborted not only in early term or mid-trimester, they're aborted, aborted now, late term. In other words, that is, children that would be born are killed because the godless of this country have made laws calling murder of the unborn a choice, a right. They claim it is a freedom, and they claim that it is liberty. In other words, they package shit and murder in a nice, lovely bag so that everyone says, well, then it's okay to do it. You think it's any different in God's eyes? Oh, sure, they aren't burning their children. No, they're just ripping them to pieces, pulling them out of the womb, destroying nature as God would have it. And who is empowering to do it? Lawyers, judges, politicians. Politicians who f have forsaken the counsel of the Lord who push for socialism, which is godless, which has ruined every nation it has ever been implemented in at some point. Some people will say, well, Canada's doing fine. No, they're not. <laughs> yeah. They may have free health care, but look at the prices of everything else there. Why do you think the Canadians come down here and, and live in the country, of, in the United States, in their old age? Huh? Verse 27. Therefore, son of man, speak unto, house the, speak unto the house of Israel, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Yet in this your fathers have blasphemed me, in that they have committed a trespass, that is, a sin, against me. Verse 28. For when I had brought them into the land, for which I had lifted up mine hand to give it to them, then they saw every high hill, and all the thick trees, and they offered their sacrifices, and there they presented provocation of their offering. Also, they made their sweet savor and poured out their drink offerings. In other words, they offered unto false gods in the groves and upon the high places. 
on every high hill and on every street corner they had a God. And in their grove worship. Verse 29. Then I said unto them, What is the high place whereunto ye go? The name of uh, uh, where is uncalled... Excuse me, let me try that again. And the name whereof is called Bama unto this day. Bama. Which is H1117 in the Hebrew language. Which means high place. And if you check it out, it means a high place of the course of worshiping. Verse 30. Wherefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Are ye polluted after the manner of your fathers? And commit ye whoredom after their abominations? Again, this, this is very prophetical to us today. We are the children of Israel here in the United States of America. Now, Israel now being colorless as far as being only the white race, because anyone who claims to be a Christian and joins themselves to our Lord and Savior becomes one of the children of Israel. However, that doesn't mean they don't commit whoredoms. That doesn't mean they don't commit sins, abominations, and everything else. I mean, even many of these homosexuals claim to be Christians. Yet, they tear the pages out of the book that say what they don't like about homosexuality. Or they totally ignore it. These are the men that came to inquire before the Lord. And this is God speaking to them and saying, do you think you're going to come and inquire before me after all of this idol worship and polluting that you have done after the manner of your fathers and committing whoredoms after their abominations? You think God's going to bless that? Why do you think this country's in such foul shape right now? Oh, the economy's good. Yeah, yeah, the economy's good. Wait till the bubble bursts. You know, there's been a lot of things going on around our country, and I'm not going to say much about this other than to mention that it happens. Earthquakes, tons of tornadoes, heat waves, oppressively cold winters, locusts, bed bugs, diseases, the red tide, so many more things that could be named. And hardly any of what they tell you. In other words, global warming. Remember when Al Gore said that the uh, f coasts of Florida all the way to New York and all the way around were going to be flooded under 10 feet of water like 15, 20 years ago or whenever it was. A and yet that ocean is still breaking right at the same place it's always been breaking. Save if, uh, unless a hurricane came in. And you could add hurricanes to the list. God is not happy, friend. Verse 31. For when you offer your gifts, when you make your sons to pass through the fire, you pollute yourselves with all your idols, even unto this day. And shall by, excuse me, shall I be inquired of by you, O house of Israel? As I live, saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. In other words, don't, don't come to me when you worship false idols. Don't come to me when you're causing your children to pass through the fire, when you're jerking them out of the womb before they're born. Verse 32. And that which cometh to your mind shall not be at all, that ye say, We will be as the heathen, and as the families of the countries, and serve wood and stone. In other words, you got people right now in this country that are preaching socialism, Okay, wood and stone is the way it was historically. People made their own gods out of wood and stone and covered them over with metal or just left them as the stock of the tree and nailed them and stood them upright and fell and worshipped at their feet. They are idols. Moreover, they are anything today, including the flesh or the wants of the flesh or the will of the flesh, which is put before God and becomes an idol. And if you think there is any such thing as a socialist Christian, then you have got rocks in your skull. There are people out there who are Christians who believe in socialism because they think that democratic socialism is going to be something different. But they've got rocks in their head. They are nimrods. 
these people stand consistently against God and with the perverse. How many right-wing homosexuals do you see in the world? Not many. How many right-wing lesbians? How many right-wing Islamics? And when I say right-wing, I mean conservative. You know, they can call it, they can call Islam right-wing because it's a religion, and of course everything religious by today's custom and today's definition would be right-wing. Uh, Hitler has been called right-wing, but he was one of the biggest leftists that ever lived. And a stain on the world. And you've even got Christians worshiping him on some idiotic website. Some of them even contacted me. Verse 33. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out, I will rule over you. Hey, the day's coming, friend. Verse 34. And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with fury poured out. Now, a lot of people are going to say, oh, there it is. There's the rapture. Except there ain't no crapture. Okay? Ain't no such thing as no rapture. Read your father's word in the languages and understand. Or read it in English and learn to count to seven. Satan is cast out at the fifth trump. He is the angel that opens the pit. He takes power at the sixth trump and Christ returns at the seventh. You know, it's not hard. A child could add it up. Verse 35. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. And there I will plead with you face to face. Verse 36. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. Again, the loving nature of our Father, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, and that all should live eternally, and forsake their fleshly ways. Verse 37. And I will cause you to pass under the rod, that is to say, the rod of correction, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. What covenant? The covenant he made with man through Christ. Verse 38. And I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that tra transgress against me. And I will bring forth out of the country where they sojourn. Or excuse me, bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, where they dwell. And they shall not enter the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Now what did that say? They shall not enter into the land of Israel. It, what is the land of Israel? That's the land of the prince that prevails with God. Why is that? Because they have transgressed against the Lord. He's going to purge them. He's going to separate the chaff from the wheat. They're going to go to the other side of the gulf and hopefully through the millennium, through the day of the Lord, where they can learn for a thousand years the truth and discipline so that they will not rebel again. And then maybe they will live again, as it's written in the book of Revelation. The dead lived not again till the thousand years were completed. Verse 39. As for you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, Go ye, serve ye every one his idols, and hereafter also, if ye will not hearken unto me. But pollute ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. In other words, if you want to go worship those other gods, you go right ahead. But don't pollute me and my holy name with your gifts and your bribes and your false judgments and your doctrines of men. Verse 40. For in mine holy mountain, in the mountain of the height of Israel, saith the Lord God, there shall all the house of Israel, all of them in the land, serve me. There I will accept them, and there I will require your offerings, and the firstfruits of your oblations with your holy things. 
Now, we're looking here towards the, uh, towards the millennium. We're looking here towards the millennium. But what are your first fruits, your offerings, and your oblations to God nowadays? Do we still offer animals? No. We offer our unrequited love. And what is, why is it called first fruit when it's your unrequited love? It means it has to be your full love. It means you've got to love God more than you love the earth or the fleshly things of the earth or even in the millennium the things which are perverse. What would be considered perverse in the millennium? Well, Satan and, and so many other things. Believe me, if there's perversion here, there's perversion there as well. That's what the whole cause of the catabole was about. That is to say, the overthrow. Verse 41. I will accept you with your sweet savor, and will bring you out from the people, and will gather you out of the countries wherein you have been scattered, and I will be sanctified in you before the heathen. The heathen being the unlearned. Again, one who's on the other side of the gulf, who didn't make salvation, and will go through the millennium, could be considered a heathen. You have to look at more than the historical here. You have to see the metaphor for what was really being talked about. I teach more from the prophetical. Verse 42. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I shall bring you into the land of Israel, into the country which I lifted mine hand up to give it to your fathers. Verse 43. And there shall ye remember your ways and all your doings wherein you have been defiled. And ye shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for all your evils that ye have committed. Verse 44. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have wrought with you for my name's sake. And not according to your wicked ways, nor according to your corrupt doings. O ye house of Israel, thus saith the, or saith the Lord God. In other words... God is going to withhold again. We're speaking of the millennium here. In other words, God could have destroyed Satan and all who followed him from the first earth age. He could have already done that. He could do it now. But it's God's will that every living thing that he created and loves, whether they love him or not, should live. However, in order to live, they're going to obey Him and they're going to love Him. Or they're not going to live. They are going to be destroyed in hell fire and turned to ashes from within. And they shall be gone and no more remembered. Verse 45. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, verse 46, Son of man, set thy face towards the south and drop thy word towards the south and prophesy against the forest of the south field. Verse 47, And say to the forest of the south, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will kindle a fire in thee, and, I shall, and it shall devour every green tree in thee, and every dry tree, the flaming flame, shall not be quenched. Let's read that again. Now, he said, the, the trees here are symbolic of the people. I will kindle a fire in thee, and it shall devour every green tree, every living green tree, and even the dry tree. In other words, those souls that ha have not made salvation and uh, obviously will not listen. The flaming flame shall not be quenched. And all the faces from the south to the north shall be burned therein. Why is north and south used here? Well, because they're opposite to each other. They're poles to each other. The north is always God's side. The south would be the side of Satan in this particular example. It, it also, it's towards Egypt. The land of idols. The land of Pharaoh, a type of Satan. Okay? So, see the uh, metaphoric symbolism in this rather than just the historical type. Verse 48. And all flesh shall see that I the Lord have kindled it. It shall not be quenched. That is to say everything that had lived in the flesh. Verse 49. Then I said, 
or then said I, Ah, oh Lord God, they say of me, Doth he not speak in parables? Uh, you know why? Because they didn't understand it. They didn't get it. Their eyes were closed. As Satan closed the eyes of Eve, their eyes were closed to the truth. Just as many politicians in this nation right now, and many people following after the lust of their flesh, and saying that they're born this way, when they're not, are more willing to give their flesh its lease and license than they are to worship the Creator that created them and that can kill their very soul. What an ignorant, perverse generation. And most of that generation that rebelled against God being born into this earth age and have been being born since about 1948 or before even. And just as rebellious here as they were there. See to it you're not amongst their numbers, brothers and sisters. Revere our Father. Love our Father. Study His Word every day if possible. Certainly weekly. Use the tools afforded to us to study our Father's Word. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. The J.P. Green's Interlinear. The E.W. Bullinger Companion Bible. The Smith's Bible Dictionary. Anything you can use to study our Father's Word, including the good old King James Bible. But before you study our Father's Word, see to it that you pray to our Father for guidance and wisdom and understanding. And brothers and sisters, remember always to pray for our brothers and sisters that walk in darkness because God knows they are the ones that need it the most. May God bless you and thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.